The Battle of Talikota in 1565 sounded the death knell of the Vijayanagar Empire. While this is a very well-known fact, few people realize that it was the Nayaka kingdoms of Madurai, Tanjore, Ikkeri, and several other successor states which carried forward the Vijayanagar legacy. Joining me today is author Leonard Bess, who has extensively studied these kingdoms in his new book, The Heirs of the Vijayanagar Empire, The Court Politics in Early Modern South India. Thanks, Leonard. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, Leonard, yeah, I wanted you. to start by asking, uh, just to give a context, because the Nayakas are not so well studied in Indian history. Who were these Nayakas? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. So basically, while uh, Vijaya Nagara um, yeah, disintegrated after that uh, famous battle that you just mentioned, um, because it was a slow process, so slowly Vijayanagara became less and less uh, powerful. Um, local governors um, appointed by the Vijayanagara court in, for instance, Madurai, in Tanjavur, in Ikridi, and elsewhere, they slowly became more powerful uh, because the Vijayanagara court became less powerful. And by the mid uh, 17th century, Vijayanagara had more or less disappeared, and all these former local provincial governors yeah, had become yeah, kings uh, of their own, uh, all carrying this title of Nayaka, which was actually a military title that they, yeah, that they still used, which they had acquired in the past. Um, so, yeah, you, you, you have a whole set of um, new kingdoms. Uh, formerly provinces of Vijayanagara that, that became yeah, new independent kingdoms. Um, and there are some very big ones, but also lots of smaller ones. So you're actually talking about a whole, yeah, several dozen of states actually. And they uh, more or less continue to exist until yeah, the, the mid or late 18th century. Yeah, so that's, in, that's in brief who the Nayakas are. Yeah. So in your book, you have studied uh, Mysore, Tanjore, Ikkeri, Madurai, uh, Ramnad. Uh, was it was there a reason why you decided to uh, focus on these kingdoms? I chose those kingdoms uh, because these are kingdoms for which we have both a lot of Indian sources. So it sort of provides a, provides us with the yeah with the local um, perspective. But for these kingdoms, we also have um, European sources. In my case. Dutch sources. Um, so we also have the external uh, perspective and then you can combine these both, these uh, two perspectives. So that was possible for these kingdoms. And for instance, not for Mysore, which was a landlocked uh, kingdom in that time. So um, there, there, there was not much contact with, um, yeah, with European traders. So you have less of uh, external perspective there. Yeah. Now, very interestingly, in your book, you look at the foundational myths and how these local governors, once they threw off the yoke of the Vijayanagar Empire, they create these stories uh, about themselves. So my question is in two parts. One is, why are these foundational myths important for a king, to, for a family to create? And second, very interestingly, you mentioned in your book about how most of the a very common thread in all of them is about how they came from the north and then set up kingdoms in the south. There is another very common theme of them discovering a great treasure. So this whole context of uh, foundational myths, if you can just uh, tell us more about that. Yeah, yeah. So uh, why are these myths important? Um, well, they, they basically serve as a way to, to, to legitimize or at least sort of explain uh, the rise of these dynasties. And they have to come up with a story. They have to explain to uh, their subjects, to other people at the court, to, to other kingdoms, um, why they have actually the right to rule. Uh, and what you see in all these foundation myths, if you compare them, is, is, a, is a set of elements, eh? a set of motives that they almost all use. Um, and these are apparently... Um, yeah, the things that you need to legitimize um, yourself as a ruler. So there's always some kind of a divine sanction. There's always a, 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 yeah, um, 
lots of heroic deeds. There's often a natural miracle. And these are all elements that help explain um, yeah, why this dynasty is in power. Um, you mentioned the migration from the north to the south. Well, not all dynasties have that, but some dynasties do. And that is because they did actually migrate from the north. And I should say that is the north usually of South India to the south of South India. Um, so what you often see, and that, that goes especially for these Nayakas, um, they often came from the Telugu speaking area. Um, and from there they moved south. Um, so even in the later periods, uh, when these when these dynasties are yeah have established themselves and have been ruling for a long time, they still speak Telugu, even though they are ruling uh, a, a, an area in the Tamil speaking uh, region. And so these yeah these 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 foundation myths and the element of migration it explains uh, why or how or when these these families or their ancestors came from the north of South India to the south. One of the things that you need if you if you found a kingdom and a dynasty is a lot of money, right? You have to pay your soldiers, you have to build palaces. Um, so you you need money. Um, and well, you, you also need a nice story to explain how you got your money, whether that's the true story or not, that's another question. But so there's there's always yeah, a story about how a treasure was discovered. Um, and then there's usually also a divine element there. So so the, the, the theme of the treasure is also connected to some kind of divine sanction. And it's usually a god or, or a figure like that who yeah, makes it possible for the... Um, uh, for the founder of the kingdom to find the treasure. Yeah. Now, Vijay, the Vijayanagar court was a very opulent court. It was known for you know its art and architecture and uh, you know great patronage. So when the Vijayanagar Empire breaks down, breaks down, and uh, a lot of these smaller kingdoms get formed, what is their impact in terms of art and culture? Because you know we see something very similar in the north of India uh, after the Mughal Empire broke up. Uh, broke broke up where all the, the painters and artists and uh, writers they all migrated to these regional courts. So did something like this happen uh, after the breakup of the Vijayanagar Empire? Yeah, definitely. I, I must I must immediately say I didn't really focus on this part, um, but true. So so what you see is that um, the successor states they sort of continue and expand on. Um, the art and architecture uh, of Vijayanagara carry it forward. Uh, what often happens, of course, is that there are temples that were already built in Vijayanagara times or even in Chola or Pandya times or, or even earlier. Um, and the Nayakas and these other successors, they keep on adding um, yeah, sections to these temples. Uh, what is also true definitely is that families of poets or painters or... Um, writers, um, um, yeah, they, they, they also migrate from the Vijayanagara court to the successor courts and continue their activities. So there's really a continuation there. Um, I think what, what maybe is uh, a bit new um, is that um, these courts even become more mul multilingual. Yeah, so, so for instance, if you look at literature, which was really a very important art form at these courts, um, there are always lots of languages that 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 are being spoken. And so there's always Telugu, there's always Tamil, there's often Kannada, there's always Sanskrit. Sometimes there's um, Marathi. So you have all these influences, also Persian, uh, yeah, all mixed up. Yeah, that is a very interesting point because now you see the South India has been divided into four distinct. Uh, linguistic provinces, and there is a lot of language politics happening. And to imagine exactly. that the, there were these tiny kingdoms who were so multilingual, where there was Tamil and Telugu and Sanskrit and Marathi and uh, Kannada, all these languages thriving together. How, yeah. did, how, how, how did the general public see see the uh, see these kingdoms? Uh, was there a conflict? Were they seen as outsiders? You, you mean at that time, right? Yes. Um, well, I can't tell you for sure, but I have never ever come across a reference um, that there was such a thing as language politics. 
uh, the kings, they usually patronized these different languages. Often they were also themselves fluent in these different languages. I know one case um, which, is, which concerns the Nayaka court of Madurai, where the Dutch report that there is some sort of clash between some Telugu speaking courtiers and some Tamil speaking courtiers. Um, but, but that would really be the exception. I think on the whole, yeah, language was not a reason for conflict. It was, it was quite normal that you would have uh, Marathi speaking communities in Tanjavur or Telugu speaking communities in, in, in uh, Madurai. Yeah. yeah. Now, you know, again, I, I want to draw parallels with North India. And since you have studied the court rituals uh, and, and the traditions in, in these courts, so a lot of the regional courts in North India uh, took, uh, I mean, they just adopted the Mughal traditions, you know, when the Mughal Empire broke up. So did something similar happen where the Vijayanagara traditions, the court traditions, uh, the share processions and courtly rituals, were they adopted to these regional courts? Since you're also speaking about the, the Mughal Empire, maybe the example I can give is concerns influences from uh, Sultanate courts, because what is quite typical for Vijayanagara is that um, Vijayanagara adopted actually a lot of political cultural elements um, from the Bahmani Sultanate and later the other Dekka Sultanates like Golconda and Bijapur. Um, and why did so? And then you should think of things like diplomatic culture, administration, law, architecture, uh, court dress is important, royal titles. Yeah? So, for instance, the the emperors of Vijayanagara also called themselves sultans. Um, and why did they do that? That was a way to connect with the most powerful states at that time, uh, which were in North India. Uh, yeah, think of the Delhi Sultanate, think of the Mughals. Um, so Vijayanagara wanted to be part of that Indo-Islamic Persian-speaking world, um, even though, of course, the Vijayan, Vijayanagara rulers themselves were Hindus. Um, and one of the things I discuss in my book is so this this adoption actually of um, yeah these Islamic or Persian elements. Do you also see that um, in the successor states? Um, and I focused. I looked at two things: titles and dress. And the interesting thing is that um, in reports of the Dutch, who sometimes sent ambassadors to these Nayaka courts, you often read. Uh, descriptions of how the king was dressed in an Islamic way. Um, so from those observations, we can yeah, sort of guess that um, in, when it comes to dress, these Nayaka courts continued um, the customs in Vijayanagara. Um, but what you also see is that increasingly um, the dress is not really Islamic anymore, but Marathi. Um, and that is actually logical because in that period, the most powerful states were no longer Islamic states, but were the Marathas. And so it made sense not to connect yourself with the Islamic world anymore, but with the Maratha world. And so it's a sort of, um, yeah, it's sort of a mechanism uh, that you always try to connect with yeah, whoever has the most power. And um, so, yeah, so on the one hand, things were continued, but on the other hand, they were also modified and adapted because, yeah, new times require your new um, yeah, solutions, so to speak. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, this was also the time when the European uh, trading companies, the Dutch, the British, the French, were establishing factories on the coast uh, of India. So unlike Vijayanagar, which is a very powerful central empire, where the Portuguese did not have much room to maneuver, uh, how were the relations between the Dutch and the other European powers with these regional kingdoms? Did the Dutch find it very easy to deal with them? Or were they difficult? Um, yeah, that's actually two questions. So one is, did the Dutch find it easy to deal with them? The answer is no. <laughs> but the other question is, um, so how were the relations? Were the Dutch very powerful? No, what, what I can say is that, um, um, so the period I look at, which is the 17th and 18th century, um, the Dutch were the most prominent European power in the Vijayanagara successor state but they were really merchants. They didn't have uh, a lot of um, political power. Yeah? So they were basically 
at the coast. They had their trading stations, um, but they didn't control large areas. Um, so it, it was not a colonial situation. Um, and basically, political developments at the courts of these successor states um, were not at all influenced by, by the Dutch. And the Dutch were just observers, basically, at the coast, trying to understand what was going on. But they didn't dominate these kingdoms. And so it was, I would say it was quite an equal relationship, um, beneficial for both parties. And so these Nayaka kings, um, yeah, they could collect toll. Uh, they gained certain prestige from having contacts with these Europeans. They received gifts. They received knowledge. And for the Dutch, of course, it was very useful because they could, um, yeah, do their trade. So I would say, on the whole, mostly um, a relationship that was beneficial for both. But at the same time, there were lots of conflicts. Uh, there were misunderstandings. Um, the Dutch uh, wanted to have trade monopolies. Yeah? So they, they concluded treaties with these uh, um, rulers. And these treaties stipulated that only the Dutch could trade in certain products. But actually, these Nayaka kings didn't care about these treaties um, and then traded with whomever they liked, including the French or the British or the Portuguese. So the Dutch then would be annoyed. And yeah, then there would be clashes, diplomatic clashes, or sometimes even military clashes. So yeah, on the whole, a relationship mostly sort of peaceful, sometimes uh, violent, um, and yeah, quite on equal terms. No, yeah. you know, uh, how, how did they have relationship with each other? Because technically they were competing for the same space because uh, Madurai had attacked Tanjore and uh, the, the Vadia, the Mysore and uh, Ikeri were fighting each other. Uh, there was Senji or Jinji, as we call it in Marathi. Uh, so there were these kingdoms who were competing for the same areas, territorial influence in the same area. So how were their relationship with each other? Between these kingdoms? Yeah, that is, that is a, a question I try to address in my book. And I think it was one of the more difficult questions. Um, yeah, how to find out what they actually thought of each other. Um, I have tried to answer that question by, by looking both at how they um, dealt with each other in practice. And there were, as you say, there were often clashes. They were often uh, fighting each other, but equally um, easy they would conclude um, peace treaties again, and then yet one year later, again, they were fighting. So this was constantly trade changing. And I call it in my book, a sort of semi-permanent, um, lukewarm uh, war. So not really a cold war, but, but not a hot war either, something in between. Um, and at the same time, I have looked at, for instance, references that they make to each other in literary works or in titles. Um, and there you see there is also some competition. So, for instance, um, one of the rulers of Mysore refers to himself as the, yeah, as the, the slayer or the, the fighter against the Andhra king. And then the Andhra king is, of course, the Telugu-speaking king of Madurai, right? So, so there you also find references. So in that sense, there was a lot of competition, exactly. But on the other hand... Um, they were also aware that they sort of together um, made up this collective of um, successor states. And so what you also see is references to, let's say, where one of the kings um, is celebrating the wedding of, of his son, for instance, then ambassadors from the other kingdoms will also attend the wedding, right? So at the same time, there was also some respect or, yeah, some kind of... Um, acknowledgement of each other's importance. Yeah, it, it's a difficult question, but I think there were really these both sides. So on the one hand, in practice, there was a lot of competition, but at the same time, yeah, they also, yeah, had some kind of respect for each other. Very interesting point about the Nayakas, especially the Madurai Nayakas, is, is their connection with Sri Lanka, because, you know, we at Levis Street have done a story on how the last Nayaka king of Sri Lanka is buried in Vellore. Uh, yeah. So, uh, because uh, these kingdoms were also closer to Sri Lanka through trade and th through their sea route and all, uh, do we find any connections uh, with Sri Lanka of these uh, uh, yeah. Nayaka kingdoms? 
Definitely. So first of all, the, the, the Nayaka rulers of Kendi, uh, and, and that was a new dynasty that, 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 that started ruling in Kendi in 1739, if I'm not wrong. They claimed some kind of um, family relationship with the Nayakas of Madurai. It's, it's a bit shaky claim. Uh, it was not very direct, but at least they claim it. So that, so that was one connection. And what you also see is that actually when the Nayakas of Tanjavur were defeated, which was already in the 17th century, and also when the Nayakas of Madurai were defeated in the, the 1730s, um, so these families are no longer ruling. Um, still the Nayakas of Kendi in Sri Lanka um, uh, marry with the descendants of those Nayaka families in South India, because that, that those are the only families that have the same status as they have. Yeah, so even though they're not ruling anymore in South India, the families are still considered very important as, as, yeah, as marriage partners for the, for the Nayakas in, uh, in Kendi. Um, so that also shows, yeah, there were, there was, there were strong connections. Yeah. So they were sort of considered to be on the same level. Yeah. No, in one kingdom which is not very well known. I mean, uh, unlike say uh, Jinji, because which became popular with the Marathas, Tanjore became popular with the Marathas. Mysore was a princely state, but uh, uh, again uh, Madurai. But uh, Ikeri is not something which is well known. And how important do you think Ikeri was in in Karnataka's history? Because that is one dynasty which is completely generally ignored in Karnataka. Yeah. I think um, you, you, you can easily say that um, in, the, in the 17th and 18th century, uh, these Nayakas of, of uh, Ikeri were, were one of the most important dynasties in uh, Karnataka and as important as Mysore. Um, because if you read what the Dutch wrote about them and, and, and how important it was for them to trade with them. And also if you read um, how there was often, um, there were conflicts between uh, Ikeri and Mysore and sometimes Mysore would win, but sometimes Ikeri would win. If you also read, yeah, um, descriptions in the Dutch records about how large Ikeri was, yeah, then it's quite obvious it was a very important kingdom. Uh, yeah, one of the most important successors of Vijayanagara, I would say there are five really important ones, and Ikeri is one of them. Um, but yeah, it has been forgotten. I'm not sure why, but because um, of course under um, Haider Ali of Mysore, Ikeri was conquered, um, annexed, and then later Mysore expanded, uh, and it continued to exist in the colonial periods. So, so Mysore is still something we are aware of. Right. There's also a town called Mysore. Right. So, so it's still it's still there. And Ikeri really disappeared. Um, so, yeah, it's a very unknown kingdom, but, but it was really very important and big and powerful. So coming to my last question, why are the Nayakas important in South Indian history? I mean, that yeah. is something. Which we that is a good. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, one reason they are important is because some scholars, um, some very famous scholars, uh, uh, David Schulman, Sanjay Subramanyam, and Narayana Rao, have argued that um, kingship in these Nayaka states was very different from earlier forms of kingship. Um, and they have they mentioned lots of things that make it different. It's a bit hard to explain it now if I don't have so much time. But they say, yeah, you really see a new kind of kingship uh, appearing in that time, the early modern period. So they say, yeah, it's something new and we should study it. I'm not totally convinced by that argument, although I think their work is absolutely fantastic and they really opened up the field. But I think there's another reason why it's very important to study these uh, Nayaka kingdoms, um, because together maybe with the Marathas and Kerala, these are the only kingdoms that have um, yeah, a sort of uh, original Indian or may, I should say Indic background. Uh, they, they, they are not Muslim states. They are yeah, traditional Indian Indic uh, kingdoms. They are the only kingdoms that have that characteristic, but existed in a period where you have both local sources and external sources. 
Eh? Um, so you can, these are the only kingdoms, yeah, let's say with an Indic culture that you can study from two perspectives. And what happens if, if you combine those two perspectives, you get a very different um, impression of how these courts functioned um, from uh, the situation where you would only study the Indian sources. So what I'm saying is, um, if you study the Niagara kingdoms, you have two kinds of sources. It gives you a very nuanced uh, view yeah, because you have the Indian sources, you have the Dutch sources together. It, yeah, they give you a lot of information. What you, the conclusions that you can draw about how these courts function is quite different from earlier periods where you only have these Indian sources, right? Because of course they give a certain uh, impression of what the courts were like, but you don't have these external sources. So yeah, I hope I make sense, but but I feel that you need to study these kingdoms because it it gives it is the the, the the conclusions you have for those kingdoms in that period have implications for other kingdoms that existed earlier. Um, so that is why I think they are actually very important. Yeah. Thank you, thank you so much, Lenart, for sharing your perspectives with us. Uh, and I'm sure our audience will uh, enjoy your book a lot. So thank you. Yeah, so much. it was a pleasure. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much. Wonderful.